Hi everyone, it's Tim Topham here from topmusic.co and I'm delighted to have Paul and Gillian from Piano Teaching Success here at Piano Pivot Live 2020 in order to record some fantastic interviews with our speakers and give you a bit of a backstage pass. And if you really want to immerse yourself in what Piano Pivot is really like and if you enjoy this interview, then make sure you grab one of our virtual tickets. The virtual tickets are fully edited professional recordings of our speakers actually on stage doing their thing, live teaching, keynote workshops. Uh, and if you want to grab that, head to pianopivotlive.com slash virtual. We'll see you there. Did you know you can keep up to date with everything that's happening at Piano Teaching Success by joining the Piano Teaching Success Facebook group? Do that now. Just search Piano Teaching Success on Facebook. Hi, and welcome back to Piano Pivot Live um, from Melbourne, Australia. And with me is, Canton, uh, is uh, Nicole. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> right, right? It's the end it's of the time. Two isn't days. It? It's been, oh, goodness, it's been exhausting and wonderful all at the same time, yeah. hasn't it? And yeah. I just so loved your session. Oh, thank it you. It was so good. Uh, Nicola talked to us about um, the, uh, the ultimate dream, the ultimate goal. Our ultimate goal really is creating lifelong musical players, players of music, players yeah. of piano. Even just musicians, I'd really like to say, because if, yeah. they, if they actually went off and went, oh, you know, I really want to play trumpet or whatever, yeah. and we've done a job in igniting absolutely. that interest, that's still tick, oh, success. Oh, that's success, yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's right. And so I just love the way that you explained it um, with a, like a, an approach where we have all of these students to start with and looking at the various challenges along the way and then how many come out at the end. Mm -hmm. Do you like to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So this is based on what we call a marketing funnel, hmm. um, which is a very useful marketing thing that I won't come into go into no. now. But I took that and applied it to the students that are going through our studio. And unfortunately, although a marketing funnel is a good thing that it's getting smaller, in our studio it's not mm, a good thing. Because no, no. we want to spread music far and wide. We don't mm. want only those who are academically gifted or only those who had parents who studied music before them to go on to become lifelong musicians. We want all of our students mm. to, be, to have the chance at least to be able to do that. Mm. But we're putting these barriers in their way. So I had little names for each one. So it starts with the sieve of parental support. Right. And that's where people fall off. And then there's various layers where the students are leaving our studio not because they don't want to play music or because they can't, it's because we're not set up for that. Yes. We're set up to suit basically us. Because we went through the system and we got there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that doesn't suit everyone. No. And it, music could be spread to so many more people if we just broadened our approach. So. Yes. And it's that flexibility. If we're offering, this is the product we're offering, or this is the this is what we offer in our yeah. studios. This is the way I do it. Right. And we have this many people start, and then gradually that gets a little bit lower, mm -hmm. and a little bit lower, and a little bit lower, and it's, it's that sort of dropout. So if, if, the, if we can widen our offerings and widen mm -hmm. what we do, then maybe the more of the more the funnel becomes a little bit wider, and then right. the little drop offs, which are inevitable for well, very, yeah. all sorts of reasons. Yeah. But if we can satisfy them, and I think. Uh, many of the um, approaches that we can use, or actually this week, this two days has been a treasure trove of ideas, still things to do with right. it. And, um, and I'd, one of the things that you particularly specialise in is, is games mm -hmm. and a gamified approach to learning some pretty boring things sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so how have you found that has helped in your studio? Yeah, well, it's really everything about my studio. And the reason is because I started taking on preschoolers and then shortly after that, because of the way my website is worded and I talk about creative approaches and I'm just friendly in my tone, I would get inquiries from parents of, of kids with learning differences and special needs. And so the games has really grown out of that. It's grown out of, there is no other way to make this work for these students and they should be allowed to learn music. I need to give them access to music. And so I've been coming up with these approaches all this time for them but it's also better for everyone yes, else. exactly. That's the magic of Approaches it. that, are, that are really um, work with uh, learning challenges, yeah. children with learning challenges actually work better really everyone. good. For Even yeah. the student who could have sat on the bench for 30 minutes, yeah, yeah, yeah. they would be better if they got up too. <laughs> yeah, right? exactly. exactly. So, yeah, so that's really where games have become that's where they a huge start. part of what I do. Yeah. 
Yeah. And um, so what part of every lesson would you spend playing games? <laughs> the whole thing. <laughs> Someone asked me this just there. The whole thing. It's not... I don't segment my lesson in that way. Okay. It's the best answer I can give. So it's not about, okay, now we're doing our games or you've focused really well for 20 minutes, now we can spend 10 minutes yeah, yeah, doing yeah. a game. Games are how I teach. They're not a part of my lesson. They are how I teach. Yeah. And so in pretty much every aspect of the lesson is gamified or made creative in some way so mm -hmm. that it's always interactive and my students are always thinking. Mm -hmm. That's the thing games actually make you do is think yes. and analyze and they create the flexible learning that you need mm. to apply that concept in another context. Mm. If you've ever had a student who they can tell you that it's middle C but then they can't actually play it at the piano or they can tell you it on one page and not on another. And you're like, what's going on? Mm -hmm. That's rigid learning, it's not flexible. Mm -hmm. And if they learned that through the context of a game where they're puzzling it out for themselves, mm. they would mm. be able to apply that flexibly in different mm. contexts. So in your studio, do you, because I, I know you've uh, written whole articles on this, uh, about the sort of various options of lessons lesson lengths and mm -hmm. approaches so in your own studio what have you found that, that really suits you? yeah so the majority of my students learn in what I call buddy lessons yeah and buddy lessons, buddy lessons yeah buddy lessons are overlapping in the middle is the simplest way to explain them so if you have Sam comes along for 30 minutes yep and then Sandy comes along and Sam and Sandy are together for 30 minutes Okay, so an hour? Yeah, an hour, and now Sam's gone away, and yep. Sandy stays for her 30 minutes one-on-one. -on -one. So you have one-on-one -on -one together, one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. Okay, so that's an hour and a half to get through to the an two? An hour and a half block, each yep. student getting an hour yep. of tuition. And so from a from a financial model, if we ask, do you charge double, do you charge 1.5 times, or what do you find works yeah. best, or what are a lot of teachers doing with that? This is something that I find <laughs> It's difficult to explain really clearly yeah. <laughs> in words. So I do have a calculator on my website okay. if people want to look that up. But uh, basically what I do is split the difference. So by that I mean the difference between the time they're going to receive, yes. an hour, yep. and the time they're taking in my schedule, 45 minutes, yes. right? Because there's two in a 90 minute block. So yep. they're taking up 45 minutes of my time, essentially. Mm -hmm. And they're receiving an hour. And so I'm charging for the equivalent of 52 minutes. Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah. So uh, if, if the an hour was $80, let's use round, round yeah, numbers because yeah, yeah. that's nice and easy. If an hour was $80 and they're taking up um, two thirds of that, that's $60? Oh, they're, they, I would be trying, so let's take $100. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if it's $100 for an hour, no, I'm not making sense. I can't, I can't work it can't out on the fly, actually. <laughs> it would be, Divided by 60 times by 52, whatever okay. we're at, yeah. Okay. We should have taken the number 60. If it's $60 for an hour, it's $52. Does that yes. make sense? It does. <laughs> That's easy, math. <laughs> okay. Let's just leave it there. Okay. <laughs> I don't think we can think anything um, yeah. like that at this time of day. Right, exactly. <laughs> After two hours or two days of completely I'm taking in all of this everything. new, new yeah. information. Which is <laughs> good. Um, so, and improvisation is another, and I thought, I really loved your approach to improvisation because it's been a big, there's a big desire in the music teaching industry uh, out there amongst piano teachers about they do they really are keen to do improvising. Yeah. Most people, I think, on a very great deal of piano teachers are thinking, I really want to do it. I don't know where to start because I didn't have that myself mm -hmm. and, and what have you. And I just really loved your approach because it was, I'm using it as a con conduit, not your word, mine, but a tool is what I normally say, so, yeah. yes, to teach a concept. Yeah. So can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, so improv for me is a tool. It's a way I teach other things and it has the benefit of they then also realise they can improvise, right? And if they want to run with that and go into jazz, great, okay. I'm not the one to teach them the actual jazz technique. What I do is use it as a tool to teach things. So everything really, but a simple example is scales. Mm -hmm. There's something in my membership called the Circle of Fifths Odyssey. Mm -hmm. Where we explore different I love your names. They're so good. <laughs> we explore a different key signature each week and we're reviewing the previous ones. And the magic of that is they're seeing what scales are for. Right? Scales are not for playing up and yes, down. Yes. And scales actually they don't teach you technique. You can play scales with terrible technique or good technique. Yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. So I don't like calling them a technique portion of the lesson. 
what scales are is a way to understand music and how it's structured. And so if you improvise with them, you're playing a chord pattern, just one, six, four, five, whatever, you know, something simple. And they play around with the scale. So we start in C and then we say, okay, we're gonna go to G major. What do you think is gonna change? If they have no idea, if they've never done a scale before, then we just play it and say, which note sounds off, mm -hmm. right? You need to change T mm -hmm. and up it goes. And then we build it up that way. So they're seeing all sorts of things from that. They're using scales and they're also seeing how the circle of fifths work and how they build up the sharps over time. Because I find a lot of transfer students students from other teachers they they try to remember every sharp in every yes. scale I'm like no you're adding one yeah patterns you know, it's patterns yeah mm -hmm. and even playing it on the piano for some students it's really da -da 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 -da. <laughs> we just do it like that <laughs> on the black keys and that's really useful just to see it that and way the patterns, yeah. like that shouldn't be the thing holding you back from playing in b majors yeah. you know yeah so yeah so they get to see all 12 keys in a really simple way we can get to the fingering later so that's just one example of using improv to teach a concept yeah but i can do that you can do it for anything yeah absolutely anything yeah yeah and you, i love the one you did you just threw it up it was on a slide so intervals oh i yeah. really love that what you said um that you do a lot on intervals because mm -hmm. um and i agree with you <laughs> uh reading most of us learn to read through an intervallic approach, like through, we reading because we're going same, 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 it goes up, up one, up one, right. up three, or whatever. We tend to, that is our really... Most of us, that's how we read, but I would question that being mo how how we learn to read, because it, yeah. for most of us, we learn to read in spite of being taught through <laughs> mnemonics. Oh, I yes. definitely did. Yes. I did John Thompson, and I was yes. taught ev ev all yes. cows, right? Yeah. All cows eat grass. grass. And face. And yes. I used that for years and it was so slow. And then yeah. obviously at some point we got over that hurdle. Yeah. But that was just through my persistence and stubbornness yes. that I yeah. just kept reading music in anyway, even though it was so hard. Yes. But if we teach our students to see the patterns, that's a much more effective yes. approach yes. to reading. And I think that this is where com coming on to the next thing, which is parent education. To some, I, I call it parent education. I think, well, yeah. and you do. And that was one of the big, I think, components that you've highlighted mm -hmm. about um, Starting in step one, yeah. kind of educating the parents, letting them know what to expect. And one of the things a lot of parents get very thingy. They know you need to read music. Everyone knows you need to read the music, yeah, right, right. and so they go, "Oh, they can't. Uh, they can't do the all cows yeah. eat grass and every good boy deserves fruit things." It, 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 they don't really understand perhaps how we all learn to how we actually read music. It's not we yeah. sitting there going, "Oh, that's a B and that's a G," and that we don't think that. We just no. think in, we just see lines, don't we? We see, see relationships. And it's one of the big struggles actually with adult students, I find, is they're trying to think all the letters. Yes. I find a lot of them come to me, like a lot of adult students have started a little bit themselves, you know, yeah. before they come to you. And so they're trying to think through the, all these letters. I'm like, you just can't do that. Yeah. That's the equivalent of sounding out a word in English. We don't do that. We use sight words. That's, yes. we see the pattern of go. We don't go go, oh, yes. you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> to be able to read fluently <laughs> and so it's the same thing I actually did a parent workshop at the start of this year start of um, September in yes, Ireland you know, yes. um, where I explained one of the things I was explaining to my returning parents was our approach to reading because I realised I hadn't really involved them in how mm. we do it and why we do it that way mm. and why I don't want you to show print out mnemonics at home in an effort to mm, help mm, your child because mm. they're trying to help right mm, when yeah, they yeah. do that yeah. but um, yeah explain filling parents in really yeah, just yeah, including yeah, them yeah, more yeah, yeah. it's so important it is because they're with the child all week you only yeah. see them just such a small amount of time yeah and um, and they, their involvement has the greatest impact mm -hmm. and I think that's um, uh, really key you know, at the point that you made because I've had heard um, some um, some piano teachers kind of really don't want the parent to be they kind of want the parent to be involved but then they don't really want the parent to be there and what have you but you know gee you've got your greatest almost your greatest resource underutilized here <laughs> yeah absolutely and that's where all these battles about exams and all of this nonsense comes from mm. is actually that they just feel left out yeah and they don't feel like they don't see the progress that's happening yeah. with their child. And the tidbits of the that. music they know is, oh, you do music, you have to learn to read, and you've got to do exams. I mean, they're yeah. probably the tidbits of things that they do. So they're sort of checking in, oh, when are we going to do an exam? Yeah, yeah. And the teacher feels, oh, they couldn't do an exam, they don't know anything. And they're just thinking, oh, I think that's the right question to ask. Yeah. <laughs> so you get this kind of mismatch. Yeah, it's the same as, as parents asking, calling up your studio and asking for your fees. 
it because that's all they care about. It's because they don't know what else to ask you. Yes, exactly. Right? So you have to give them more information. One of the biggest changes that I made in my early teaching was when I realized why parents were demanding an exam, you know, mm -hmm. as a young teacher. I started at 15, right? So I was pretty easy yeah. to push around. Yeah. <laughs> and so when I realized, okay, they're asking for that exam because that's their measure of progress. progress. And if I just show them what progress is there and communicate that clearly, I don't get, I ne they never push for an exam. They don't care. Yes. They just want to see that their investment is worth something and yeah. that their child is getting somewhere. Yes. And that's fair. Yeah. Right? Exactly. So, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And I think that's so, you know, the, the um, ideas and tidbits and some guidance that you gave us was just so invaluable and it makes us think about all those things. And so, thank you so much. I've oh. had such a great time meeting you and yeah, uh, getting to know to you, and uh, and and your sessions being fabulous. So thank oh, you. Oh well, thank you. My pleasure.